Hello YouTube, new program with you. Tonight we're working on Peter Pritchard's training regimen. So from what I see here, this is going to be something that resembles an upper lower and he trains five times a week. And I see something that resembles an arm day in his program. I say that it resembles it because he didn't give any indication. So when I don't have indications, I just go off of what I see. So let's start. For this one, what we're going to pay attention to is the variations used by uh, Peter because he has something that I recommend people do, which is having a week A and week B without necessarily splitting the two weeks, but just having rotations of lifts and lifting rotations within certain days that create a, a, a bi-weekly rotation in a sense, because the day can be so different that it can constitute a different day but the skeleton of the day remains. So it's still an upper day. You're still working the same uh, muscle groups, but you're going to rotate movement patterns. And that also entails that you're going to stay within the range of specificity. So you're going to see that he actually does that quite well. He does other things that I think could be corrected. So we're going to get into that. So on Tuesday, he starts with bench press. And from what I see here, he says four to eight by three, which in, in my repertoire means four reps, four to eight reps for three sets, which I would say is an excellent evolving rep range. That being said, he adds afterwards that he's, he slaps on an extra set each week, and then he adds five pounds and start over. So I'm, I suppose it means that he does four sets of three and then ramps up to eight. So he repeats sets of three up to eight sets. To me, that's a little bit much for bench press. It might not be the best for progression because it's not super conducive to it. You are super turbo suits and bagging when you do something like this. And yes, those are quality reps because if it's a good three rep max, you're pushing yourself. But by virtue of you repeating that up to eight times, it cannot be a quality three rep max because it's not a three rep max. You really have to manage your strength to be able to repeat that eight times. So I, I, I suppose you just had a typo here, but I would actually go back to a four set of, uh, three sets of four to eight for the bench press because it's an excellent prep range. And from what I see, it's the only horizontal press of the day, which would also mean that doing more reps would be more beneficial. That being said, you could argue that his tactic of doing multiple sets of three could also fulfill that, that role. But I will always go with a, with, a th with three sets of strength work and then two sets of back of work with a pose. That to me it takes less time and is just going to be better overall. After that, he does weighted chains. So a great movement on an upper day. Vertical pose, you need to have them in your program. If you can't weight them yet, don't, it's fine. But you have to have them. He does four sets of four to eight. Excellent rep range for that as well. I have nothing to say about that. And he tells me that he he switches the grips. A good investment if you have a home gym and you have a rack where you can bolt a pull-up bar on would be to get a multi-grip so that you can do neutral, you can do chin-ups, but you can also vary the width of the grip because that's just as important. Because I found personally that the one true limiting factor on vertical pose is not the, your upper back because your upper back can handle a ton of volume and recover super fast. It's not upper back injuries either because the upper back, I mean, probably one of the parts of the body that is the toughest to injure, it's really the connective tissues that are going to be the issue. The connective tissues and the tendons of your elbows and of your, uh, and of your shoulders as well and of the bicep tendon are going to be aggravated uh, with time if you don't know how to do pull-ups properly, if you overextend the tendons, if you pull with your arms, and if you do the same pull again, again and again. If you do only one type of pull-up with the same grip every time, you're going to get an overuse injury over time. So you need to vary it. And switching the grips not only helps with that, it helps with also feeling certain parts of your back better. So that's an excellent choice. And you can just say, oh, I'm, I rotate every two months. What I personally do is I do pull-ups every day and I have certain days where I have a certain grip assigned to that day. There, so I don't, I don't have to rotate it. I know on what day is what. And I can also match the grip with what I do on that day. So that's a, that's a good approach for that. After that, he does neutral grip. 
axle or log over at press. So neutral grip, I suppose, would mean that you use something like a Swiss bar. So he, he's basically doing an overhead press movement on that day. For uh, five sets of eight to 12, that's, that's a lot of volume for the horizontal press, uh, the vertical press, but that's good because presses, you can really press a lot, of, uh, a lot of weight for a lot of volume. That being said, again, if you need variety, if you need something to help you progress, you could, you could do three sets of six to 10, you could do three sets of even two to five, switch it around. But if you see good progress on something like this, keep at it. It's very good. This is where we see the first, uh, the first occurrence of what I spoke to, uh, I spoke about in the introduction, which is the rotation of lifts. But technically, what he's doing here is that he's not going anywhere outside the range of specificity for a vertical press. He's staying as close as he can. For example, if you do an overhead press with a bar and you switch to an axle bar, yes, it's not a barbell overhead press, but it's it's its direct brother. If you were to do it on your knees or sitting instead, that would be a range of specificity that would be a little bit further away. And the, the further you go, the less it feeds the lift to the point where you can get into something that still technically works the same muscle like a lateral raise, but it's going to have almost zero carryover to your main movement. For bodybuilding, you need the movements to feed each other because on a for people who are past the novice phases, you're going to desperately need that to be able to progress. So that's an excellent use of that. Just doing, doing it with a different grip, doing it with a different bar, it's still specific. Then it does penlay rows, five sets of eight to 15, quite high volume on the penlays. That being said, it's the upper back. I would say, however, that depending on how you do your penlays, you've already done weighted chains. So it depends. If you've done your weighted chains with a closed grip, you hit mostly mid back. So I would say that a, a normal pen lay row would be fine. If you've done your weighted chains with a wide grip, I would encourage you to do your pen lay rows either to the sternum, not to the belly button, to the sternum, or even a little bit above if, you're, if you have the shoulder mobility for that, so that you can get more traps and upper back in. And then he does neutral grip school crushers, which I've personally never tried. I'm sure they feel amazing. Five sets of uh, eight to 15. That to me is too high, meaning that it's a long head of the tricep movement. It's one of the tricep movement that you can use the most weight on. Of course, you want to be careful about the health of your elbows. So you don't want to push the intensity like a monkey and just do terrible reps. But this is a little bit too high, I would say five sets of eight to 12, even that is too high. Four sets of eight to 12 would be quite excellent. So in order for you to not just repeat reps that might not be at the highest intensity, but still keep you in waters that are technically easy to handle in terms of injury prevention, give, give four sets of eight to 12 a try. And then he does dumbbell curls, five sets of eight to 15, same logic. I see you do your isolation movements like this and I understand why. But I can tell you that over time, it's not the best. I, I know that a lot of people have that knee-jerk reaction where they absolutely want to do more reps and sets for the small muscle groups. And there are multiple reasons for that. But you cannot treat those muscle groups differently than you do the other groups of your body. They respond to intensity just as well. And the issue is that you start doing too much junk volume when you do that. Because if you can repeat if you can stay between the 10 to 15 for five sets, you're a little bit too high, in my opinion, in volume and a little bit too low in intensity. You want to scale that down just a tiny bit. And I can tell you that you're going to see a difference. And also because keep in mind that scroll crushers and, uh, and bicep curls are movements that typically are going to incur a powerful pump, which a lot of people like, a lot of people don't realize, however, that sometimes the pump is going to limit your ability to work because the muscle is going to be so gorged with blood that you can barely move. And the issue is that the muscle is not tired. It just cannot move because it's now stiff, it's rigid with all the fluid that's in it. You're not being stopped by your ability to move the weight. So that could me make you sandbag and it stops progression. So pay attention to that. Then he does face pull, three sets of 15 to 20, excellent, nothing to say about that. So in terms of, um, of supersets, the bench press is the strength work, we don't superset that. The weighted chains, I would scarcely superset that either, so I leave that be. The neutral grip of red press is a lot of volume, it would be 
it would be tough to superset it with something. Technically, you could superset it with the dumbbell curls if you want it. The penley rows can be superseded with the neutral grip scroll crushes if you want it. And the face pulls, if you add a back offset of bench press, could be superseded there. That being said, keep in mind that it's going to tire the shoulder for the overhead press, so it might not be the best choice. So you could just end the day with a giant set of penley rows, um, penley rows, scroll crushes, face pulls. That would be fine. Yes, it would tire the real dart for the pen lays, but you will find that it's not the main mover on the pen lays, so it's not going to damage progression. So that's day one. Wednesday. Wednesday is a lower body, because this was an upper body, uh, an upper body day. And uh, as you see here, technically a pen lay also works the legs, but minimally. So that I would say that this is a, an upper body day that respects the codes of upper lowers. It doesn't cheat you will see that it's much tougher to respect that type of conundrum and requirements for lower body days because on his Wednesday, he starts with SSB squats. Okay, no problem with that. Three sets of five to 10, good rep range. Uh, and he tells me once three sets of 10 is hit, increase the weight 10 or 20 pounds. Okay, I get, I get where you're coming from. A 20 pound jump is a lot of weight. Uh, especially if you're past the, the learning phase where you're just learning the lift. I would say also that this method of increasing weight using evolving rep range can be subpar, meaning that if you absolutely want to hit 10 tenths, uh, or maybe, okay, so maybe what you mean here is that if you can get one set of 10, then you go up in weight, even if the two other sets are not tens, which in that case, it's fine. But if you're telling me that you wait to get three sets of 10 to jump up your sandbagging and your limiting progression and you're limiting your ability to get a taste of higher intensity that helps you progress evolving rep range if you don't understand what i'm saying it's all in there then he does ssb good mornings i would say that if you do ssb squats you're already doing a variation of the squat that requires more posterior chain more rhomboids tends to fold you over more don't don't listen to people who tell you it's like a front squat it has nothing to do with a front squat it's the exact opposite of a front squat actually so you might be overutilizing those, move, those muscles when you follow that up with versus be good mornings. I would also advise people to not pair their good mornings on the same day they, they do their squat, if, if it's a back squat. Front squats pair extremely well with good mornings. But anything that really taxes the posterior chain, be careful because the good morning is one of those movements that do not forgive if you're fatigued. Because if you go in them fatigued with a lower back that's already taxed and you don't have and you don't maintain rigidity, you can get injured. I personally like to treat treat my good mornings as the main posterior chain movement of the day. So if I do a day full of pure knee flexions, I will have my good morning in there. But I usually don't like having that good morning compete with an other hip hinge movement because I really, to me, I treat it like a deadlift, like a heavy high intensity deadlift. Even though I'm in, in high rep ranges for my good mornings, I don't, I don't mess with that lift. I do it all the time, but I respect it. If you don't have issues with that, by all means, but be careful. I would say, however, that good mornings, three sets of 10 to 15, excellent prep range, do not go below, do not go below six easy reps on the good mornings. That would technically mean don't go below eight, meaning that you, go, you do six with two reps in the tank. There is no point in going lower. I mean, for hypertrophy, there is no point. Leg curls, four sets of 10 to 15. So at this point, you're doing an isolation movement for the arm strings that is already really taxed by your two SSB movements, if you need it, by all means. But understand that unless you're trying to correct a quad arm string imbalance, this is really skewed towards arm strings. You, you, get, you get, of course, quad with the SSB squad, but not as much as you would think. But for the rep range, nothing to say. Then you do seated and standing calf raises, three sets each, with no rep range, so I suppose high volume, I hope. That's very good. It's fine to have movements on the, on the calf raises that compete with each other. That being said, understand that the movement that comes first is going to, to be the one that progresses the most. Then he does wrapper wrist curls, axle reverse curls, three sets each. It's funny, you're doing the same superset I do. And a lot of people would say, well, isn't that counterintuitive? You're doing two movements for the forearm. Yes, but one is 
a pure crushing movement that involves an elbow flexion. The other one is a wrist flexion that doesn't involve any crushing strength. So they actually complement each other incredibly well. Try it, do reverse curls and then wrist curls all the other way around and let me know how your forearms feel. They're going to feel like they're about to pop. And he does three sets each, he doesn't give me a rep range. Then he does trap bar shrugs, three sets of 10 to 15. Good rep range for the shrugs, 10 to 15 is what I usually prescribe. Trap bar shrugs depends on how your traps react to the rotation of the shoulder. For some people, the neutral grip is going to feel great. For some people, it won't. If it feels great for you, do it. Plus, a trap bar shrug is really the easiest way to set up a shrug. The only thing is you will have to pick it up from the floor. But, and that actually could represent an issue because if you're really strong on the shrug, that pull from the floor still represents some work. And the issue is that you've done so much posterior chain work that it could potentially be an issue. So just keep, keep that in mind. Plus, if it's not an, a hard pull, unless you're really doing slow and control for range of motion shrugs, you might be underutilizing your traps. But that day to me looks like the day of someone who is really focusing on the posterior chain. So if that's the case for you, by all means, keep doing that. I would say, however, just for the, for the anecdote, that this is not a lower body day. This is what a gentleman's plate would look like, meaning that it's, uh, you're training the upper body and the lower body. But that's excellent because that's what a lower body day is supposed to look like. You will find that you can be minimalistic for the legs and the lower body with deadlifts and squat variations and throw in some isolation if you really want. But then at some point you realize that your upper, 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 upper body days are becoming so long and the lower body days are so small and short. And the reason why is because you get that space in the lower body day so that you can pack in more upper, back, upper body movement, especially for the upper back, like pull-ups and stuff. They need to go on your lower body days, which is why those are not really lower body days anymore. Let me check uh, if the camera is recording. Yes, we are alive and well. Okay, so that's for that day. In terms of supersets, we don't superset the SSB squat. We don't superset the SSB good morning. SSB good morning, I would only superset it with may if you have an amazingly strong core, maybe leg raises to deload the spine, maybe some forearm work, but don't mess with anything else. You don't want to be fatigued for these. Uh, the leg curls can, can and should be superseded with the seated uh, calf raises. Then you can superset the standing calf raises with the trap bar shrugs. And then you can do the wrist curl axe, uh, axe or reverse curls as its own thing. So that's three supersets. First day is rest plus calves. He worked calves on Wednesday. You might think, oh, well, should he work it again? If he has the ability to recover from it, yes, because the calves are a small muscle and uh, they, they get burnt quick in a training session. You won't be able to do six or seven hard sets of calves, but you will find that they respond very well to training, uh, to volume and frequency. So hit them with that. Friday is another upper day. It's the second upper day, actually. Overhead press. For, uh, so he, I think he, he, it's the same principle he applies to bench. It's four to eight sets of three reps. If you, uh, Peter, if you see that video, I'm going to pin your comment. Explain to me. If, if it's the set thing, explain to me what the logic is behind it. Because it seems quite convoluted. Plus, it takes you... It takes you four weeks with the same weight of repeating threes to up the weight. Is that practical? Do you enjoy that? I'm not questioning it or saying it's stupid. I just want to understand why you do that. Because I would say three sets of four to eight would be much better. Especially when I consider that the other overhead press that you have is eight to 12. So it matches. Uh, so it, uh, it actually is a lower rep range, which is what I would prescribe because it would feed intensity into the lift. You see here that there's a strong focus on overhead press because your overhead press is twice a week, which for people who want big shoulders, you absolutely should be doing that. Then he does cable rows, five sets of six to 12. Okay, see that's interesting because five sets of six to 12 represents a very good evolving rep range because if you can get 12 on the first and it's a challenging weight and it was a true 12 set max, you are going to get 10 or 11 for the second then maybe 10 or nine then maybe seven or eight, 
then maybe six or seven. So the last set will be a six or seven. So six being the minimum amount of reps makes a ton of sense. Cable rows, one of my favorite isolation movements for the upper back, one of my favorite cable movements in general, good movement, uh, good programming for that. After that comes the close grip bench press, five sets of eight to 12. Okay, so same logic as what I just said. We will go from 6 to 12 to 8 to 12. So there's going to be a, an amount of sandbagging here that will be directly correlated with your ability to go back to baseline for that lift. I'm not saying you're sandbagging. Maybe you have the ability on that lift to do 12, 12, 11, 10, 9. That's possible. But I like the rep range. It's your horizontal press for the day. It saves the shoulders after your red press. You might find that you're a bit fatigued on that uh, lift because you've already done a red press. But that's a choice, that's a programming choice. And you switched it around because on Tuesday you had your horizontal, then vertical press, and now it's the opposite. So you prioritize one over the other, one day and the other day is the different one. So that's good, shows to me that you actually know what you're doing. And you sometimes swap this uh, with dumbbell bench or floor press. Okay, so here we're starting to see a degree of specificity that starts to fade away a little bit because a close grip bench is not as specific to a dumbbell bench or a floor press. They are actually represent very clear categories of horizontal press. But that's fine. As long as you know what you're doing, that's fine. Chin-ups after that. So I suppose unweighted. Three to five sets. As we as possible. Excellent. You want to complement that in your training. You will find that doing weighted pull-ups might start ingraining a certain technique in you because you're really starting to pull against a weight and you're starting to to slowly move away from body weight and i truly believe you should never turn your back to body weight so that's good these will not fatigue you because once you start developing the ability to move weight when you do vertical pulls calisthenics is going to, going to feel like nothing it's going to actually be a good injury prevention tool and it's going to work as nucleus overload pretty much then it does triceps push downs five sets of 10 10 to 12, 20, very good reference for that movement. Cable curls, five sets of 10 to 20, same logic. Face pulls, three sets of 50, uh, 15 to 20. Lots of face pulls, and that's great. Do your face pulls. If you do them properly, they are going to be a great tool. So, I wouldn't change much on that day. That day is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit heavier on the cable movements and etc. but that's not an issue. Uh, for isolation because I see there are compound movements that are taking care of the tonnage and progression aspect of the day. In terms of supersets, supersets that make sense, the close grip bench could be superseted with the chin-ups, uh, especially if you do five sets for them. So you could do your first, if you do three to five, you could do your first two sets of close grip bench where you want to be at your max and really push the performance and then superset the last three sets with the chin-ups. The cable rows need to be superseted with something. You could superset them with uh, tricep pushdowns if you wanted, or maybe even the face pulls. I would pick the face pulls. And depending on that day, I would suppose that with the aggressive rep range you picked for the cable rows, you wanted to progress. So you will do overhead press first. That will not be superseted because it's strength work. Overhead press first, then cable rows superseted with the face pulls. Then your close grip bench press so that you actually get also a day. Uh, um, you get some space between the overhead press and the close grip bench. So you get that uh, intra-workout frequency and you, you can actually try and go back to baseline a little bit for those muscle groups. So that would be good. So your close grip bench that you superset with the chin-ups. The chin-ups are going to directly follow the cable rows, but it doesn't matter because you don't worry about performance is as many reps as possible. And you finish that big with tricep pushdowns and cable curls for five sets. Excellent day. Nothing to say about that. Very good upper body day. And then Saturday, which is the second low body day, he starts with a snatch grip or deficit deadlift. Three sets, uh, so same progression as squats. Okay, so I'm going to suppose... Yeah, okay, I'm going to suppose that you just messed up a little bit with what you wrote and the bench press and your overhead press are three sets of four to eight because you tell me that the SSB squat is three sets of five to ten and the snatch grip or deficit deadlift is three sets of three to five. Okay, do the evolving rep range, I will not touch, excellent choice. 
Same for the snatch up or the seated deadlift. Three to five reps. That's your striking zone. That's high intensity, but you're not messing with one rep maxes. I would. I love that for deadlift. Three sets of five can actually represent a challenge. Three sets of three to five is my favorite choice. I sometimes tell people just do one set of five because it still pushes progression. And I personally don't chase tonnage accumulation on deadlifts. It's a way for me to open a session because it warms up the entire body. It will make me stronger over time on everything regarding hip hinges and lower body movements. But I will not grind an extra rep just to get 500 extra tonnage. So keep that in mind because you can manipulate the intensity to be a little bit uh, on the lower side if you reduce the size of the set if needed. In terms of logic, snatch grip or deficit deadlift, you might think to yourself, okay, that's another example of a, li of a lifting, lift rotation that is far removed from specificity. Actually, no, those two movements are extremely similar, meaning that they force you into more knee flexion, they force the hips to be lower when you pull because of the positioning with a deficit deadlift because you're standing on something, so the bar is further away, and on the snatch grip because you lengthen, I mean, you lengthen the arm technically, but what you're really doing is that you are lengthening the range of motion by unlengthening the arm in a sense, because when the arms are directly perpendicular with the floor, they are their longest. The more you move them to the side, the shorter they become, if that makes sense, and the more you have to move the bar through a range of motion. And since the range of motion is not moved by the arms, but, but by the lower body, you need to go into a deeper flexion. So they actually complement each other really well. One is going to be better because it's going to involve, in my opinion, more lumbar spine, which would be the deficit deadlift. And the snatch grip is going to involve more upper back. Leg extensions after that, okay. So you take the, you basically apply what I said for the first lower body day, more quad work, even though you will find also because of the way most people pull on the snatch grip, they tend to pull with uh, the toes pointed out, it recruits the quads quite a lot. And also because when you go down to grab a, a snatch grip dead, you have a tendency to, to turn the movement into more of a knee flexion naturally, when the deficit deadlift tends to remain for a lot of people more of a hip hinge because of where your arms are because you cannot really allow yourself to go into knee flexion because if you do the bar is going to start underneath the knee and you you don't want that but with the snatch grip it's possible for people who have tried both they know what i mean so leg extensions three sets of 20 and you want to hear my thoughts on a squat variation that could go here what set prep scheme to use i pretty much only use the ssb okay well, I would absolutely rep uh, replace the leg extension. And we want to have you do a squat variation that is going to be, as I said for your, uh, your Wednesday, less posterior chain focused. So I would absolutely not have you do an SSB squat here. I would have you do either a Zercher squat or I would have you do a front squat using the SSB, which both of them have a learning curve. So you're going to have to start extremely low you're going to have to slowly ramp up the weight, slowly see where you're standing. And if they feel good, but if they do feel good, you will like them. Why? Because the snap grip and deficit deadlift are going to reinforce the lumbar extension and the strength of the, of the lumbar spine and posterior chain. The uh, Zercher squat and the front squat with the SSB are going to reinforce a thoracic spine and extension and the strength of the quads. So they complement each other quite well. They both uh, recruit a ton of core, but you should be able to deal with that. So I would do that. And in far, as far as the set rep scheme to use, I would do something because of your, your uh, high volume selection for the main strength movement. I would do something that would stray away from an 8 to 12 because that would be too much volume. Three sets of 6 to 10 could be quite good for those two movements. So that you still remain with weights that you can easily rep and control, but it actually represents something that is uh, beneficial for you. And my p computer is actually going to die already. Wow. All right. Well, I'm going to pause here for a second so I can actually grab the battery. And we're all back. 
back. The laptop it is now charging. All right, so I really want to finish this because it's a good program. So I just spoke about the deadlifts. I just spoke about the variation I would put as a knee flexion here. And since you use the SSB, I, I also think that those variations are going to help so that they can complete your uh, arsenal in terms of lower body lifts. Then you do leg curls, three sets of 20. Of, uh, 20. You'll see if that's still relevant. I mean, because what I just told you to do can also be applied to your Wednesday if you want to replace the SSB good mornings in a rotation by something else. You know, or just uh, as you learn the movement, the zercher or the front squat with the SSB, you could replace the leg curls on your Wednesday by those movements, but just do them super light, like with nothing challenging, just to ingrain reps, just to learn the lifts. And so the, the leg curls that you do afterwards could be replaced depending on how your arm strength feels. Technically, I wouldn't replace them on that day because they represent the stretch of the arm strength that is beneficial for hypertrophy and injury prevention. Then you do your seated and standing calf raises and your trap bar shrugs, perfect. Leg curls, superset them with the seated calf raises and the standing, you superset with the trap bar shrugs. Again, I see all trap bar shrugs through sets of 10 to 15. That's not bad per se. If you want to try a weighted stretch, like actual heavy weighted stretch on the traps, you will find that it saves a ton of time because it's super efficient. So if you do, let me know. You can try the knee part shrugs. You can try certain types of rack pulls. They all work. That's, that's if your trap bar shrugs are not giving you the results that you want. If they do, by all means, continue. Sunday, which is on arm day. Uh, Sunday is easy bar curls, three sets of five to eight, excellent rep range, Intense enough, but not, not solo that you're going to have bad reps. And some people might think, wow, three sets of five to eight, that's too low for the bicep. No, that's actually great. Biceps respond very well to high intensity training. Of course, you don't want to be swinging weights if you don't know how, what you're doing, but you need to have intensity for your smaller muscle groups. Overhead tricep extension after that, three sets of six to 12. So that's another long head. I see you don't neglect the long head. That's very good. Three sets of six to 12. It would be, would be on the opposite side of the evolving rep range. It's you're giving yourself a lot of room to, to do reps because in reality, three sets, usually you do six to 10. Then you do ring push-ups, three sets to failure. So as many reps as possible, very good. Then inverted rows. It, it's, it's funny because this is an excellent uh, arm day and I, I see the, the, I, the philosophy behind it and it's, it, I had a thought about something resembled, resembling this uh, a few, few, I think a few weeks ago. So it's like a deja vu for me. So inverted rows, three sets to failure, okay. Then uh, wrist curls or axle reverse curls. So you really, you have a strong focus on the forearms. That's good. And lateral or real delt raises after that. Okay. Uh, just as a parenthesis, if you have a focus on those, do that type of uh, development for your forearm, invest in grippers. They are not the greatest for forearm hypertrophy, but they do represent a very good investment for grip strength that is going to carry over to your ability to hold onto weight that you rep for the forearm. So you might have to consider that. That's a great arm day. I have nothing to say about that arm day. Uh, supersets, superset the ring push-ups and the inverted rows, absolutely. And uh, that's it. You can superset the overhead tricep extension with the lateral or real delt. Uh, the easy bar curls is strength work, even if it's just a curl, we don't touch that. Perfect. Monday, you do rest and calves, so you work the calves a ton. That's... If I, would be, if I were to be nitpicky, you don't train your neck, you don't train your abs with isolation, you could also add that. You wouldn't even have to add that on your training sessions. You could add that on your rest days. You could do circuit with calves, <laughs> with calves, neck, and, uh, and abs on your rest days. Besides that, everything is trained. That's a good program. So the few movements that I told you to add, you could add. Let me know how you feel about that. If you comment, I will pin your comment. But for people who listen to this entire thing, if you're looking for a good upper-level uh, upper program, Plus arm day, that's, that's a good choice, I would say. So I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you for watching and have a good day.